Hi, this is Carrie Bible, tour guide at the Hollywood Forever Cemetery, and now we are back for week three of my Hollywood Forever tour talk. You might notice something a little different going on today. I am wearing color. Normally, when I do the tour, I wear a black vintage gown or a vintage recreation gown that's black. And I feel like black's the color of mourning and appropriate to wear on a cemetery. But it's been very hot in LA lately and about 80% of my apartment doesn't have air conditioning at the time, at the moment. And also, I'm gonna talk about Judy Garland today. So for both of those reasons, wearing bright colors seem to make sense. So that's, that's what I'm doing. I'm easing my fashion restrictions. And so for future casts here, I might actually wear color. I'm wearing a 1940s seersucker house dress right now. So um, an update on the tour. Uh, basically, the tour is still on hiatus. I know they are starting to ease restrictions around the city of Los Angeles, but I still don't think it's right to start doing the tour just yet. I'm kind of basically in what I would call wait and see mode. So that's that's where things are at. Plus, it's really hot. So when I do go back to giving tours, people will have to wear face masks, stand six feet apart. And right now, I don't really know if people want to stand in really, really intense heat with a face mask on. So anyway, we'll we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. So I hope all of you out there are doing well and staying safe. So a couple things I wanted to talk about this week, but originally I had planned to alternate. Maybe I started off with Carl Dane, who is a more obscure star. And then last week we talked about Valentino, which was appropriate because this past week, May 6th, marked the 125th anniversary of Valentino's birth. This week I was going to talk about a more obscure star to kind of balance everything out. But this week's been particularly tough for a variety of reasons. I'm sure probably many of you as well. So I just thought, you know what? I'm gonna just change my plans and talk about Judy Garland this week because that just feels like the right thing to do. So that's what we're gonna do. All right, some people may not know that we even have Judy Garland at Hollywood Forever, but we do. A long time ago, I started hearing rumors that we were going to get her transferred from New York to Los Angeles to our cemetery. I'd hear rumors it was happening and then rumors that it wasn't. And for like over 10 years, I would just hear occasional rumors, but nothing ever happened. So I really didn't think much about it. And then in um, 2017, it happened. And how that came to be, uh, when Judy died, she was only 47 years old. She died in London. She was on her fifth marriage at the time to discotheque manager, Mickey Deans. She'd been married to him very briefly. I don't think he barely knew her, but he wound up making all of the arrangements and all the plans. And Judy wound up at Ferncliff Cemetery in upstate New York. Well, for a long time, uh, she was there. And the thing about that is that it's Ferncliff is a lot harder to get to. And also all of her children, Liza Manelli, Lorna Luft, and Joe Luft now live in Los Angeles. And they made the decision that they wanted to be with their mom someday. So Judy was disinterred from Ferncliff, flown to Los Angeles, and interred in what is now called the Judy Garland Pavilion at Hollywood Forever. I was told this was going to happen, but I was kind of on gag order for several months. It was really hard to know this and not be able to geek out and share my excitement with the world, but I was on gag order for a while. And then on Judy's birthday in June on 2017, we had a private ceremony in the Judy Garland Pavilion with only Judy's family, friends, and special guests. And then that night, the people who run Cinespia showed The Wizard of Oz. And after that, the cemetery gave me full permission to include Judy on the tour. So we've had Judy in residence, if you will, for about three years now. And to me, it's been such a joy to have her here. I know some people questioned the move, but to me, it feels like a homecoming because the mausoleum next door called Abbey of the Psalms, we have Victor Fleming who directed Wizard of Oz. We have a cenotaph for Toto. We have the cinematographer of Wizard of Oz, Harold Rossum, the costume designer of Wizard of Oz, Adrian, Judy's frequent co-star at MGM, Nikki Rooney. It just seems like it's the right thing for Judy to be in Hollywood. And you know, one of the things I always point out on the tour is that many people don't realize Judy had an incredible sense of humor. 
she was such a funny person. And to be honest, I think she would laugh at the whole thing. I think she'd be like, really? I have been dead for decades and I'm making a comeback. I think she would just think it was hilarious. So I, I think that sense of humor really, really kind of translates and it's easy to see her being amused by this whole thing. Now, when I take people into the area, when we first got Judy, my first thought was, well, I have to redo the entire tour because now we have Judy. But then the more I thought about it, I'm like, well, I can't start off the tour with Judy because then it's kind of downhill from there, sort of, you know. And then Valentino is kind of right at the center of the tour. And then the more I thought about it, I thought, well, save the biggest, best for last. So just end it with a bang, end it with Judy. So that's what I did. So I wound up not actually rechanging the format of the tour and just basically ending it with Judy Garland instead of Estelle Getty. And that's kind of what wound up happening. And it's been really amazing to see how emotional people get when I take them in there. I've had people walk in there and just burst into tears. Uh, there was one young man as, as we walked, started walking in, just tears started pouring down his face and he was kind of wiping them away. And I could tell he was embarrassed. And I went over and I put my arm around him and I said, look, you know, the first time they took me in here, I cried too. So it's okay. It's okay. And then I've had people walk in there and just start singing at the top of their lungs. So, and it's not just one demographic. It's not just one age group or demo. It's people from every age, every background, every race, all over the world. I mean, I have seen reactions from the most diverse array of people. And it just kind of speaks to Judy's global impact. And over 50 years after her death, this how much love there is for her and how emotional people still get at her memory, at her films, at the sound of her singing. So it's been really cool. And also people have left paintings. People have left gigantic rainbow floral displays. And also the room Judy's in, for those of you who haven't taken the tour, um, it's got, it's covered in beveled glass. Beveled glass basically has this little edge around it. And when the sun is very bright and it hits that glass, at just the right angle. It casts rainbows all over the floor in that room. I kid you not. And the first time I saw that happen, it's one of those moments where all of your hair stands up and you just think, oh, wow, this is like so cool. There's rainbows all over the room. So that's really been awesome, again, to see people's reactions. Now, when I talk about Judy, one of the things I feel like is important about what I do sort of is to honor these people and to help people from new generations discover their work, discover their artistry. And what I seek to do is really to honor them and to do the right thing. Like, I feel like I have a responsibility. I try to read as much as I can, talk to people, watch documentaries, watch movies, absorb, you know, everything that I possibly can. And with Judy, I know there is the elephant in the room, her struggles, the tragedies of her life, etc. But unlike a lot of other perspectives, I acknowledge the elephant in the room, but I try to treat the elephant a little differently, if that makes any sense. <laughs> Basically, um, Judy's story is pretty well chronicled. Um, there have been feature films like the recent one with Renee Zellweger. There was a TV series 20 years ago with um, Judy Davis. There have been countless books, countless documentaries. I mean, basically, it's common knowledge. So I just kind of gloss over that and hit a few of the high points. And then what I do is I talk about what I think Judy would want, and that's being remembered for her work. Because she hated the narrative that her life was this pathetic sort of e true Hollywood story or tragedy. She felt, and she even insisted in some interviews that she had a pretty good life. I mean, it obviously it, there was a lot of up, there were a lot of ups and downs and tragedies, but she really didn't like the portrayal of herself as this pitiful, tragic creature. Her kids hate that narrative too. So I feel like if I stand at her grave and go at great length into that narrative, it's really not honoring her and it's not honoring her life and the way she would have wanted. 
I mean, the basic facts are Judy was born in Grand Rapids, Minnesota, and both her mom and her dad were vaudevillians. She was born in 1922. And so basically she was born into show business. Her mom and dad um, had a show that included her two older sisters. And Judy made her vaudeville debut at the age of two years old, singing Jingle Bells on stage. And she liked to say she felt that she never really left the stage after that. So Judy quickly was absorbed into the family act and her real name was Frances Ethel Gum. So even announcements of Judy's birth said something to the effect of the gums had another stick. So vaudeville though was not fun in games actually. Vaudeville was pretty brutal. You rode in trains, you washed clothes in the sink, you slept in train cars, you slept in really cheap boarding houses. It was constant travel, seven, eight shows a day, multiple shows a week, just it was extraordinarily grueling on these people who did this. And they basically barnstormed all over America. And when Judy was uh, 13 years old, about, no, about 12, I think, um, they changed her name. She changed it. She suggested Judy, and I think George Jessel suggested Garland. So she became Judy Garland, which was a much more marquee friendly name. And of course, her sisters kind of got tired of the act and it quickly, very quickly emerged, even when she was very little, that Judy was the, the great talent and the great star of the family. So Judy signed with MGM and she was about 12, 13 years old. And unfortunately, at that time, that's a difficult age. You're not a little kid. You're not a full grown a teenager or adult. So it was a while before they kind of found the right formulas and the right roles for Judy. Um, sadly, after she signed with MGM, not too long afterward, her dad died and her dad loved her unconditionally. And that was a very devastating blow that probably stayed with her for the rest of her life. At MGM, and as many of you probably know, the studio system itself could also be pretty brutal because when you signed with them, you weren't really a human being, you were property. And you belonged to a studio lock, stock and barrel. What you wore, what you ate, who you dated. I mean, everything about your life was more or less controlled by them. In fact, Eva Gardner used to joke, MGM was the only department store where the mannequins went home at night. But really, this was no joke. This was kind of tough when you're being looked at as a product and not as a person. And for a sensitive child who's lost her father and really not had any kind of childhood, that was a, that was a difficult situation. And I'm only going to briefly touch on it, but yes, they did give Judy pills to make her lose weight, pills to keep her up, pills to put her to sleep. And I think this, of course, had a very, very damaging effect on her. But that said, what, what stays with me is the fact that no matter what personal heartache and turmoil she was suffering during her life, it didn't show on screen. She always gave 110%. She always gave every single thing she had for the camera, for the audience. And I think that's what she prided herself on was her gift of helping people forget their troubles, forget the depression, World War II, whatever else the problem wise was kind of raging outside the doors of the theater. When you went and saw Judy Garland, you could escape into a world of joy and happiness and music for a few hours and leave the world behind. And Judy made tons of classic films at MGM. Like many kids, I grew up watching Wizard of Oz. When I was a little girl, we didn't have yet VHS even. So once a year, we'd go to my cousin's house and watch it on TV. And that was a big deal because you couldn't record it. It wasn't like it is today. It was like a big event to get to see that film on TV. And I think that film has touched so many people, of course, all over the world. So The Wizard of Oz, of course, her classic film at MGM, but tons of great others, including For Me and My Gal, Easter Parade, The Harvey Girls, Meet Me in St. Louis, tons of, tons of classic films. Judy Garland left MGM in the late 1940s. And around that time, their relationship, her relationship with MGM was just completely eroding and she, they parted company and it was a very devastating time. And Judy basically reinvented the wheel. She rose time and again throughout her life, kind of like a phoenix rising through the ashes. So she went to London and did shows in London on stage, which was her great love really was the stage. 
And that launched a huge comeback for her as the world's greatest concert performer. She wound up selling out the London Palladium. She went to New York and sold out the palace for I think like months. She went back to Los Angeles and this led to her comeback film, A Star is Born, which would be the second official remake of that film. And this was the first musical version of it. This was, many people have described it, and I would also agree, this is like the greatest one woman show in movie history. Judy is so, so good in this movie. She will just break your heart completely. And the movie got a ton of Oscar nominations. One for Judy, of course, Best Actress, her first Oscar nomination. Unfortunately, she didn't win. That's kind of considered one of the greatest Oscar injustices of all time. And I definitely agree with that. She absolutely should have won. But I think also it was very political. I think to a large degree, Oscars are, I mean, yes, they do reward talent, but also there is a lot of politics. There is also a lot of popularity. There's a lot of other things kind of going on in the mix besides just sheer talent. In any case, uh, Judy soldiered on. Um, by this time, she divorced her first husband, musical composer David Rose. Her second husband was her Meet Me in St. Louis director, Vincent Minnelli, who she had Liza Minnelli with. She married Sid Luft, who became her manager. That was to be her longest marriage. They were married about a decade. And Sid Luft helped her get A Star is Born off the ground, helped her get a lot of the shows that she did, the stage shows. But unfortunately, they wound up getting a divorce as well. And pretty much from about the early 50s until the end of her life, Judy's primary means of expression was the concert stage. She did make a few other movies here and there. She picked up another Oscar nomination for the drama Judgment at Nuremberg in the early 60s. She was nominated for Best Supporting Actress. But she primarily, she also did television. I mean, Judy really left behind a tremendous volume of work. She married struggling actor Mark Herron briefly and then her fifth husband, Mickey Deans. And Judy had three kids, as I had mentioned, Liza Minnelli, Lorna Luft, and Joe Luft. And toward the end of her life, Judy was in London, she was on her fifth marriage, and her body was just shutting down, I think, from the drugs, the alcohol, and also so many decades of just absolute overwork. Judy literally worked herself to death. And she died in London in 1969. Last summer marked the 50 year anniversary of Judy's passing. And her daughter Lorna wrote this really beautiful letter to the cemetery about Judy's memory and her legacy. And they, they put it up in the room where Judy's at and people could come see it. There's also a guest book in there. But like I said, I mean, I do acknowledge the, the troubles Judy had, but I really try to focus on the gifts that she left us and the power of her legacy. Now, there have been so many books about Judy Garland, and I don't know, a lot of them I feel like don't really get it right, because I have read several, and many of them focus on the extremely lurid. They kind of neglect a lot of her artistry. They're kind of a real mixed bag. There's really only one book that I feel totally safe in recommending, really, and that's the book by her daughter Lorna Luft called Me and My Shadows. And obviously it is written from the daughter's perspective and point of view, but it's honest, it's frank, it's brutal at times, and it's also done with a tremendous amount of love. And in spite of all the chaos and turmoil, all of her kids insisted they felt very loved by Judy. And Judy fought to keep her kids. She fought to help take care of them. She did the absolute best she could under some pretty horrible circumstances. So this book is really, it's really good. And um, it was the one that was the basis for the uh, uh, 2000 movie starring Judy Davis that was a, a TV series. It's probably on the internet somewhere. But um, I think that Lorna's courage and her honesty really shine through in that book. And I highly recommend it. As with all of the books that I recommend on my little live cast, um, if you want to buy it, I do recommend going to Larry Edmonds in Hollywood because, again, they're the oldest bookstore in Hollywood, I think the only one left, and they could very much use your support. If they don't have books, by the way, a lot of times they can find them for you, order them, they can ship them to you, or as I do, you can even call and pull up and have them put them in the back of your car. So call Larry Edmonds, reach out to them, and see if they can find that for you. 
And also, as for the movies, all of my Judy movies are actually not on physical DVDs, but on my DVR in the other room. But they turn up constantly on Turner Classic Movies. All of them are on almost, I think all of her movies actually are on DVD. And I really, really recommend them. Again, especially when you're having a hard time because these movies are so joyous and they really do lift your spirits and take you out of your troubles. So I, I can't recommend them enough. And I just love Judy so much. I, I get emotional talking about her too, because like a lot of people, I really, really care about her and really love her. And again, I think also one point that I always drive home in my tours as all of these stars, they may have been icons and legends and all of this, but they're human beings. And I think a lot of times people lose sight of that. So Judy was a person, she was a mother, she was a sister, a friend. And I think that that's something people should always remember, you know, and also in the way that they speak to and treat the children as well. That's gotta be very tough being the child of a legend. So the book actually goes into that too. So I recommend the book. And again, I know probably most of you have seen Judy Garland films. If you're watching me, I'm assuming that you have. So, but Judy really is just the gift that keeps on giving. And as I also say, when I talk about Valentino, I feel like there are some stars that are very much of their time. And there are other stars that are for all time and they will never, ever, ever go away. They will always shine. They will always be remembered, always be loved and their films will always be watched. And I think that is certainly true of Judy as well. I bet 50 years from now, 100 years from now, people are still going to watch Wizard of Oz, still going to watch other movies of hers, and she will truly live forever. So someday when this whole, this whole nightmare of COVID ends, I do, if you haven't taken my tour yet, I hope you can. And I hope to share Judy Garland's area with you and Again, I think you'll feel a lot of awe and reverence and just a lot of emotion when you when you get to see it. And I hope all of you do. Another anniversary that I did want to talk about this week is the film The Black Cat. Um, there, this was a horror film. It was notable because it was the very first time. Sorry, it's so hot in here. Uh, there was the very first time that Bella Lugosi and Boris Karloff were co-starring in the same film together. Both of men, both men, of course, are my girlhood heroes and horror icons. Bela Lugosi, of course, for playing Dracula and Boris for Frankenstein. Well, Black Cat was their first pairing. And the director of Black Cat was a German man named Edgar G. Ulmer. He worked in the German film industry and worked on the classic from the late 20s in Germany, People on Sunday. He came to Hollywood and he directed the Black Cat. And it's such an interesting film. I have to warn you, it's very, well, okay, for the 30s anyway, it's very kind of perverse and shocking. The sets are very German Bauhaus and Art Deco and really, really stylish. Even the German production designer, I think Karloff's character was named after him. And interestingly, this film was made universal. Well, when Edgar Ulmer was making this film, he fell completely in love with the script girl. Unfortunately, she was married to someone from Carl Limley's family, and Carl Limley ran Universal Pictures. So this was this was bad for Edgar G. Limmer. Um, Shirley got a divorce from the Limley family member and went on to marry Edgar G. Ulmer. So Edgar and Shirley were kind of driven out of Hollywood after this because you don't cross Carl Limley. So they worked in low budget film together with him directing and she as the script supervisor. And Edgar G. Ulmer is at Hollywood Forever, he and Shirley. They are in the new Beth Olam mausoleum, or also I think called the Hall of David. And they also went on to make the terrific low budget film noir detour. But Black Cat really remains as probably one of their biggest achievements. And that film was released May 7th of 1934. So the other day was the anniversary of that film. And if you've never seen it, you'll see why it is kind of controversial. I mean, there's a scene in the film where Bela Lugosi strings Boris Karloff up like this and basically threatens to skin him alive and then later does. So for the 1930s, this was really, really, really shocking stuff. 
and it kind of upset a lot of people and it was it was just kind of considered the last straw and how out of control some people felt Hollywood was getting and the production code would come in not too long after the Black Cat's release but it is on DVD it's available and again, Edgar G. Ulmer as a terrific director, kind of one of the unsung directors that we have at Hollywood Forever. And I encourage you to see The Black Cat. And of course, speaking of black cats, which, which I often do, I have a weekly tale of little close up, my black cemetery kitty cat that, that loves me. Okay, so bef right before the pandemic, one of the final normal Thursday before this whole thing went, this whole crazy thing happened. It was a lovely family from Australia, this wonderful woman named Melissa and her husband and her three children and her sister. They took the tour and they'd read about it in Australia, evidently, and they, they just loved it. They had a great time. And the little girl, her little girls were real little and close up actually approached the little girls and the, he let, he deigned to let the little girls pet him and kind of play with him. They bought him treats. They had such a good time. They fell in love with Close Up. And just this past week, they sent an entire year supply of cat treats from Australia to my apartment in LA. So I now have a year supply of treats for Close Up. And the other day I, I took a bunch of the treats out to the cemetery so Close Up could behold his bounty. I gave him a bunch of treats. He was very happy. But it's really hot right now, and I've learned from having had a black lab that if you have a black furry animal, when it's really hot, it's like 10 times hotter for them. I mean, it really is. And so after his meal, Close Up basically retreated to a shady area of the cemetery with some marble in the shade, curled up on the marble, and basically went to sleep for the afternoon. So um, in a little bit, I will post a picture of Close Up taking a nap at the cemetery and He's happy, it's just really, really hot right now, so it's it's not easy for a close up, but he's doing well. All the cats there are doing well. And um, if you have any questions, by the way, feel free to leave them in the comments or comment on my tour page. I'll do the best I can to um, answer those comments either in written form or even address them in next week's episode. So again, stay tuned for future tour information. I do miss doing it terribly. I mean, I've been giving these several times a month since 2002, so over 18 years. This is the longest I've gone in over 18 years of not giving a tour. So I hope that I remember how to do it. <laughs> and I really look forward to getting back to it. I look forward to our world being back to normal. I'm fortunately though, I guess I'm gonna have to be patient because that's not gonna happen overnight. But this has been so much fun to be able to share this with you guys every week. I love film history so much. I drink, eat, sleep, and breathe it. And to me, it's given me so many gifts. I've met so many wonderful historians and friends all over the globe who share my passion for old Hollywood. And right now, to be honest, that's kind of what's keeping me sane. So I thank you everybody who's reached out and wanted to chat or talk or recommend a movie or discuss. And thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. I really appreciate that. And I hope everybody stays safe. Please have a good week. If you want to share memories, recollections, anything about Judy on the page, do it. That's awesome. I love Judy. And thank you so much for tuning in. And I really look forward to see you all next week. Bye-bye.